Today's session brings you perspectives on Canada's immigrant future, a new project at Cities of Migration that explores the challenges and opportunities of immigration in our small cities, towns, and regions. The Immigrant Future webinar series is presented in partnership with Higher Immigrants Magnet, Hamilton Economic Development, the City of Moncton, the Halifax Partnership, and the Leeds Grenville Local Immigration Partnership with funding support from Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. Today's webinar is about immigrant futures. We'll be looking at regional strategies for northern attraction and retention. From Atlantic to western and northern regions, small and regional communities across Canada and across the U.S., many places, are facing unprecedented challenges related to demographic change and population decline. Research plots an aging population and plummeting birth rate against a growing gap in labor market a gap that's exacerbated by the out-migration of rural youth and working-age population. Today's webinar offers a regional perspective on how Northern Ontario communities are responding to these challenges with innovative policy uh, and programs that identify immigration as a primary strategy for local economic growth and development. We are joined today by Christina Zeffi, former research analyst with the Northern Policy Institute, by Kathy Woodbeck, Executive Director, Thunder Bay Multicultural Association, and Meg Ramor, Project Coordinator with the North Bay and District Multicultural Center. I'm delighted to welcome our first guest speaker, Christina Zeffi, who is the author of the Northern Policy Institute's 2019 Northern Attraction Report Series. Christina is a former research analyst at Northern Policy Institute with studies in sociology and criminology from the University of Toronto and public administration from Humber College. Christina's research interests include immigration reform and policy related to Indigenous affairs, the environment, and mental health. Today, Christina is a Human Re Services Planning and Program Support Analyst at Halton Region, Mississauga. Um, welcome, Christina. Delighted to have you. The podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, before I begin, I just want to thank the Cities of Migration and Evelyn and Kim for inviting me to speak here today about my research. I'm really excited to share some of the approaches and strategies that can hopefully help address some of the challenges that small communities face when attracting and retaining newcomers. Um, so thank you, everyone, and let's begin. So before I dive deeper into the research results that I found throughout my project, I just by demonstrating the need of newcomers to Northern Ontario. So this first graph population growth in the eight northeastern Ontario districts. With the exception of Manitoulin and Perry Sound, the population declined since 1996. So here we see with the exception of Kenora, Thunder Bay and Rainy River experienced a decline in their population. Um, so in addition to the community leaders you see listed right there in the middle of the slide, the committee involved other key players such as youth groups, churches, volunteer groups, ethnic support groups, recreational departments, and marketing clubs, just to name a few. Once they began their initiative, they identified some challenges that they were facing. First of all, um, the seven communities had their own unique challenges and goals they wanted to achieve. For instance, Verdon, Reston, and Pipestone are looking at 10 to 15 years of fast growth inspired by an oil boom, while Boisevin had more than 200 jobs to fill, but they were lacking housing, land, and business opportunities to accommodate newcomers. Other recognized challenges of a regional approach through this study were defensive postures and home turf issues. However, the study revealed that having a clear and defined objective along with recognition of how different mandates can complement one another encouraged communities to address these issues. So there were six lessons learned that came from the um, Southwestern Regional Immigration Committee. The first is to prepare for newcomers. So this includes establishing partnerships within the community, discussing strategies, and having a knowledge base. The second was to raise awareness in each town about newcomer attraction initiatives before marketing communities, recruiting newcomers, or smoothing out settlement services. By doing this step, it increases the knowledge base and attracts key players that want to be involved. The third lesson learned was to develop a solid understanding of desired newcomers in, and disseminate that information through population growth strategies such as recruitment and marketing. And the fourth one was to tap into existing population of immigrants through a survey that gathers information on why newcomers move to the given area, the issues that they faced when they came, how these issues could be addressed for the benefit of future immigrants, 
and learning from these lessons. The fifth lessons learned was assessing population growth strategies to determine what is working and what is not, and then readjusting the strategies based on this. And the final one is to ensure that the business community is involved. Because the business community is going to be helping with the settlement of newcomers and, you know, providing jobs for these people, it's really important to make sure that they are involved right from the beginning as their voices are heard. So the initiative is relatively new. The definitive conclusions can't be made just yet. However, we can have a quick look at the data from Census Canada on immigration for these Manitoba communities just to see how they're doing. So the data reveals that four of the seven communities experienced an increase in immigration between 2006 and 2016. And we can see specifically that the communities of Melita, Verdon, and Riverdale, that the number of immigrants almost doubled in this time period. Two other research findings that I want to highlight today focus on how the provincial and federal government can help break down employment barriers for immigrants and international students. The first option is to dedicate two to four provincial or federal employees that can run workshops or meetings for employers to help them navigate their province's provincial nominee program. The second option complements the first in that the government employees could train the trainers. This would be training local champions such as the Chambers of Commerce, community volunteers, or economic development officers who could then help businesses in completing paperwork related to accessing the program. These two strategies would help businesses engage with the province's provincial nominee program, resulting in more usage and efficiency. Another program that I came across in my research that helps break down employment barriers for immigrants and international students is the National Connector Program, which begins in Halifax. I've included a link there on my presentation, but we don't have enough time to uh, go through that today, but I will go through the steps of what the program does for newcomers. So first, local immigrant servicing organizations or post-secondary career centers refer employment-ready participants to the program, and these are called connectees. Then the program staff coach the connectee and match them with the connector in their field of work. Finally, the connector and connectee meet, and the connector introduces the participant of the program to at least three more people in their business network. Those three people then refer the participant to three more people. So this would mean that the connectee has been introduced to a total of 13 people in their business network. And this says a few things. So ultimately, this program provides the connectees or the participant with more confidence and insight into the labor market. This emphasizes on building connection between newcomers, the community, and immigrant service serving organizations. Another program that I want to discuss today that I came across in my research and, and is also run in partnership with Northern Policy Institute is the International Community Matchmaker Project. So this was first launched in Thunder Bay. This offers employment entrepreneurial services for potential and international migrants. A unique feature of this program is that the program can assist anyone. So whether you're already in Thunder Bay or whether you're anywhere else in Ontario or Canada or anywhere in the world, the International Community Matchmaker can help match you to a job within the community that you're looking to settle in um, in Northern Ontario. This project supports both the employers through the immigration process and newcomers by helping them find meaningful work in their communities. So the suggested strategies in my report are meant to add to the great work already taking place in Northern Ontario. There are a number of initiatives and organizations working endlessly to attract and retain newcomers to Northern Ontario. Through this work, a targeted and collaborative approach is the most efficient and works best. Strong partnerships, breaking down silos, and constant communications are key ingredients to a successful immigration strategy. So these are just some of the other initiatives that are going on in Northern Ontario that um, I'm not going to speak too much on just in case the other presenters will touch on, but there's the Northwestern Immigration Portal, which is the talk to chat function that is run by the Thunder Bay Multicultural Association. And then there's the Thunder Bay Multicultural Association, which is an online offers online language classes and settlement services to the larger part of Northern Ontario. Post-secondary institutions also have their piece in the newcomer strategies in Northern Ontario, and this is through immigration advisors, training programs, and international agents. And then there are cases where Northern Ontario has engaged in some international recruitment fairs and secondary migration strategies. And finally, there's the official languages action plan, which looks to enhance Francophone minority communities through immigration. And we've reached the end of my presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Christina, very much for the tremendous work that you've done at the Northern Policy Institute and for um, this morning's insightful analysis and the great examples that you shared with us of what can happen when you get a well-coordinated regional 
attraction and retention strategy in place. So, so now let's shift the conversation from policy uh, solutions to look at um, some local innovations led by community leaders in the northern Ontario cities of Thunder Bay and North Bay, respectively. So let's start first. I'm delighted to introduce Kathy Woodbeck, who is Executive Director of the Thunder Bay Multicultural Association. Kathy, um, uh, the, the Thunder Bay Multicultural Association is an immigrant serving organization that serves all of northwestern Ontario, an enormous region uh, the size of France. She has been, uh, Kathy has been a member of the National Settlement Council and has represented rural, northern, remote and smaller centers in a number of capacities including 25 years in the immigrant settlement and language sector where she has served as mentor and counsel to executive directors and agencies across Canada. Kathy holds a master's degree in English and is currently the provincial appointee on the Lakehead Police Services Board, a busy woman. So thank you um, and uh, over to you, Kathy. The podium is yours. Thank you so much, Kim, and good morning and good afternoon to everyone uh, participating today. And thank you for letting us join in this discussion. Uh, Thunder Bay, the Thunder Bay Multicultural Association, as Kim said, really does serve a large area. And um, it is larger than the combined size of the UK and France. It has a widely dispersed population of just over 250,000 and 36 smaller communities. So this is the size of our region uh, on this map. If you look, and you can see Lake Superior there in the center of this photo, pretty much everything from Lake Superior North and Lake Superior West to the Manitoba border is the region of northwestern Ontario, with Thunder Bay being the largest uh, community. We have a satellite office in Kenora, which is closer to the Manitoba border. And be between those two agencies, we have uh, 20 staff, serving folks across that area and actually really responding to questions from people from around the world who are looking to relocate in these communities all across northwestern Ontario. So that kind of puts our region in perspective. It's a broad area with about 250,000 people located across it with a real shortage now of labor and some issues that are going to be facing us in the near future around population growth. So this is my view as I drive into work in the morning. You may have heard of Thunder Bay because of the Sleeping Giant, and that's that rock formation out in the harbor right there you can see on the top of the photo. And we're located in an old fire hall. It's a historic building, and it's a wonderful place to come to work every day. So what are the issues? What are the issues in our region? There's plenty of employment, but not enough employees. Our numbers have been going down, and unemployment numbers going down over the years. We have a lot of businesses that would really love to, the owners would love to retire, sell their businesses, but their family aren't willing to take it on or aren't interested and they're not able to find owners. We have a growing economy in a number of sectors in our region, biomedical, mining, many different areas, and employers are coming to us requesting um, connections to employees and to skilled labor, and we've been really trying to recruit over that in the last few years. Population growth is non-existent, as I said. It's slowly going down. We realize we're coming to the edge of this cliff, and uh, more and more people are starting to realize that we're getting closer to that, and we need to think about what are we going to do for population growth in our region. So our uh, dependency ratio is getting closer and closer to having more uh, dependents than workers, and we need to work on that. And I think that, um, I'll come to later in the presentation, that's really one of the wake-up calls that has gotten more and more people involved in this discussion. More uh, employers, more community members, more agencies are starting to think about what is going to happen, what are we going to do for uh, filling filling employment positions in our communities. And so this right here, as far as the information that the Northern Policy Institute has put together as a snapshot and then a longer looking picture of what we're going to be facing in the Northwest has really um, caused a lot of um, businesses, employers, uh, municipal governments, you name it, to become involved in this discussion and start looking at how are we going to uh, do some recruitment, how are we going to get more people involved. So newcomers, some of the issues that we've, we've been speaking to newcomers, and like Kim said, myself, 25 years of 
talking about this with newcomers, is what brings them to smaller communities? What brings them to northwestern Ontario or to Thunder Bay? And many of them have said, it cost us too much to live in the large city. Um, we really had no hope of purchasing a home. We would have been renting in an apartment for a long period of time. Um, we wanted to find employment for both uh, folks in a family. We were looking at um, living a little more rurally and being able to commute to a city. We um, liked out the outdoors. There were a number of reasons why newcomers um, had told us that they were interested in coming to northwestern Ontario. So this is a labor force, and these are some of the same things that Christina was just talking about. Um, unemployment rates are consistently falling in northwestern Ontario. And retention rates are increasing. And I believe this is mainly because of employment and um, sustainable employment in uh, decent paying jobs that are keeping people in the community and that are then allowing them to purchase a home, put down their roots and remain in northwestern Ontario. Full-time and full-year median employment income, um, as you can see, for immigrants, for francophones, for Indigenous folks, for um, youth in our communities, that income level is right up there with the rest of Ontario and, and probably with the rest of Canada, but the cost of living then is, is quite a bit lower. What are the differences? Their availability of all programs, um, settlement language, uh, daycare, employment connections for newcomers to the region. Um, employers are becoming more and more involved in the recruitment of newcomers and more involved in the work that we do. But in our community, we've really spent a lot of effort developing this non, uh, no wrong door policy. We've, we've tried to get everyone informed, educated, working together, coming to the local immigration partnership meetings to talk about what's available in this city, where do newcomers go for each of the services? What do employers do when they're seeking recruitment in specific areas? So we work together on that and we can all provide direction and information and later case management when people arrive in our community. And there's a lot of community desire and community volunteer involvement with the desire to help newcomers, to mentor them, the connector program, and trying to um, match folks up with those that are interested in helping them and helping grow our community. And many hands do make light work, but many people doing the very same thing all across the city do not. So we've really focused on consolidating committees, reducing those silos where many people were doing the same thing across our community. So we did a bit of, uh, you know, what is the landscape and who is out there and what are we doing and combined a lot of those. And a lot of that was done through the local immigration partnership where all the municipalities came together but service providers came together, chambers of commerce, settlement, economic development, employers, planning boards, housing, uh, education, all came to the table to talk about, so what do we do and how do we do this well and together so that we're not each just doing a small project that others aren't aware of. So that communication process was very critical in this, in this growth and in our success. The Refugee Resettlement Assistance Program, RAP program in Thunder Bay has been very successful in connecting newcomers with employment, the employment piece of our um, settlement work here, as well as um, retaining those folks in our community. So now who does what? How do you bring all of these people together? You really do need the quarterback, the conductor, that bus driver that is going to keep everyone on the same page, keep everyone informed, bring everyone together to have these discussions about what is happening and to um, manage that information. And you also need champions in the sectors in your community. So economic development sector, the settlement and newcomer integration sector, certainly employment both with employment agencies that are connecting people to jobs, but also employers, as well as housing and certainly education, the schools both for um, secondary, um, primary school and uh, post-secondary. So here are some of the folks that were involved with the Community Economic Development Co Commission of Thunder Bay and the Thunder Bay Multicultural Association kind of taking the lead both on the northern, um, rural and northern immigration pilot as well as the local immigration partnership.
and then melding those two groups together to have these discussions. Because we really know that we want to attract about 5,000 people per year over the next uh, five to 10 years, and then more over the next 25 years with growth in industry and this aging population that I was talking about already. So municipalities are involved, and you can see them all there. Organizations are involved. Uh, individuals are involved and collectively we are all promoting and doing that education piece and I think that was one of the points when, when uh, Christina made the point about um, informing and preparing from the previous work done in Manitoba making sure that your community knows what's happening making sure that you are having whether it's town halls or forums or doing promotion however you can around the community is critical that everyone is informed. We take it to City Council. City Council meetings are televised. We bring as much information as we can. We host community forums. We host uh, meetings and an immigration forum once a year that we welcome everyone to come to and hear about what's happening. And I think one of our strategies as well is not to throw the net out too wide. When we first started talking about attraction and retention, we talked about um, doing this promotion around the country, around the world, trying to uh, bring newcomers to Thunder Bay, to northwestern Ontario. It was overwhelming. There were too many calls to even answer in emails. And they were in areas that we could not find employment for folks in. So we realized quickly that that had to be narrowed. The focus had to be narrowed and really attract based on what is needed in the workforce, what is available in housing, what is happening with our um, education institutions, and look at a little more focused than what we had done when it was the broad uh, toss that net out wide. So we developed an inventory of all of the existing aspects of all of these small communities. Where was housing available? Where were the jobs? Which fields were they in? Which, what was the workforce going to be looking like and what are the needs over the next few years? And just as we were working on all of these things, the rural and northern immigration pilot um, was announced and we applied. So we're, we're working through that. That gives us a real um, a real pilot situation, a testing ground to see what's going to work and how this is going to work with employers involved in the settlement process as well as economic development, as well as settlement agencies. And this understanding that it's not just a job that's going to settle someone here, that that process of support and welcoming and integration and settlement happens in the workplace, it happens in the school, it happens in the grocery store, it happens at the recreation facilities, it's not just a responsibility of a settlement agency. And so we've been talking about how do we train, inform, encourage our community to do some of those things. And each of the smaller communities have a plan, and their municipalities and their councils have thought about an immigration plan and a an, and, uh, welcoming plan so that they're ready for whoever may arrive. Some of our progress so far is we've created a job aggregator on our um, Move to Northwestern Ontario immigration portal, and that is really a collection of every posting of work in our region so that a newcomer can go to the site and look at that and see what is available in the region. The Go to Thunder Bay site and the Rural Northern Immigration Pilot will be um, hosted through the City of Thunder Bay's Community Economic Development Commission, and that will have all of the available positions for that pilot. We've had success in employment and in placing folks, so that retention piece is there, and I think uh, word of mouth is as, as good uh, an advertising as you can get. And the Northern Ontario, Northwestern Ontario Immigration uh, Portal, as well as the um, local immigration partnership are always having uh, discussions about we're going to put this information up everywhere. It's not just on one site. We lead each other to the other site depending on what the issue might be. The uh, NOMA is the Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association. That is all mayors and councils of all of our uh, northern communities and they come together and we are always invited to present at their meetings. So they come together twice a year and we're able to be there and inform them of what's happening. 
Here's my contact information. These slides will be ab available to uh, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity. I know it's a lot of information in a short period, but I welcome any questions that you have. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Kathy. That was just wonderful. I, I really, uh, I, I love your no wrong door approach, uh, that whole of community approach, which we know is really critical to making integration work. Um, so thank you very much for showing us how, um, you know, city and community leaders can, can work c together collaboratively with local employers and service providers and, and ordinary residents to, to really build this welcoming economy that, that is so important um, to our future. So thank you. And now let's shift um, again once more from Thunder Bay to North Bay. It's my pleasure to now introduce Meg Raymore. Meg uh, is passionate about building safer and welcoming spaces throughout her community. She is coordinator of the North Bay and Area Local Immigration Partnership, um, where she develops programming and resources with her LIP partners to increase her community's capacity to recruit, retain, service, integrate, and fully value newcomers to Canada. Um, Meg is an experienced facilitator on topics like anti-oppression, positive, safer spaces, and power and privilege. Um, she practices inclusion in process and in action. And we welcome um, her uh, to the Learning Exchange at, to join us here today. Welcome, Meg. The podium is yours. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, it certainly sounds impressive when someone else reads your bio that you put together, so I appreciate that. <laughs> kind of boosts up my ego before I start talking. Um, <laughs> hi folks, like Kim said, my name is Meg Raymore. Um, my pronouns are she and her, and I am the uh, coordinator of the LIP here in North Bay, Ontario. So to give you an idea of where North Bay is, um, depending on where you are joining us from. So Northern Ontario, and uh, Kathy, who is speaking, she's from Thunder Bay, Ontario, and you might think that we're close, but we're about 1,100 kilometer drive apart, so about 12 hours. Um, so we're a good distance apart, and I'm um, that little red dot uh, that you can see on the screen. Um, we're about a three and a half hour drive north of Toronto, um, close to the Quebec border. So. I won't read out all of the numbers that are on the screen there, um, but one thing to know is that North Bay, we like to say that we're the gateway to the north. Um, so we're at the beginning of the north, I suppose. So you'll see from the uh, data on the screen that North Bay, um, so North Bay is within Nipsing District, um, and I gave you the kind of different numbers there. So North Bay sitting around just under uh, 52, and then the district is about 83,000, and then our trading area is up in uh, 112. Um, so from the last census, we have had a population decline similar to a lot of um, especially smaller communities, northern communities. Um, not so much when you consider the context of Nipsing District. Um, the newcomer population is roughly 6%, um, but, and, and, and that probably seems small to some bigger centers, but um, it's, it's a good chunk for us and we are hoping to increase it. Um, Kathy mentioned that Thunder Bay was one of the chosen communities for the RNIP, the Rural Northern Immigration Pilot. Um, North Bay was as well. And so that will definitely be one vehicle for us growing our community. And in terms of our economy, um, there's no kind of one sector that, that um, is, is, is with our economy. It's, it's fairly diversified. Um, so there's lots of different jobs in lots of different places. So I'm here to talk to you about the Skilled Newcomer Career Loan. Um, which is a community loan program. And this came um, as a, a project of the Employers Council, which sits under the LIP, the Local Immigration Partnership. Um, and so what, what we were hearing from employers is that they had some newcomer employees that were great and they really wanted to be able to keep them or move them up, but there were barriers around WES assessments or upgrading their skills and that kind of thing, along with um, we, we were hearing that from our partners at Economic Development at the city. So we were wondering, well, you know, what, what can we do about this? Because we are in North Bay, and so um, even to visit uh, IRCC office, it's a, it's a, you know, Toronto is, is the closest. We used to have Sudbury, which is an hour and a half west. But it, it's, there's a lot of distance that you have to cover to kind of do any of these things um, and stuff around upgrading and, and uh, those kind of things. So we really wanted to try to take an innovative approach to how can we retain the talent and the people that are already here. Um, and so the Skilled Newcomer Career Loan was, was born. And so really it's designed to help skilled newcomers living in the Nipissing District 
upgrade their credentials or do whatever they need to do to get back to work in their field in, in Nipissing District. Um, there are other programs, national programs, um, it used to be the uh, Immigrant Access Fund, now I believe it's called um, Windmill, um, that, that do similar things and actually we, we chatted with them uh, to see you know, what, what did they have to offer and, and could we do anything different. And what we really saw is that because of our size of community and because of the folks, some of the newcomers that, that you know, we initially had in mind that this could really benefit, um, was we needed flexibility. And so that's why we didn't partner SAFE with uh, IAF. So kind of the basic overview, um, the career loan is character-based. So you, don't, you do not need Canadian credit or collateral um, to apply or receive this loan. That is a major barrier. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know that international credit is usually not recognized. Um, and so if you're trying to start out your life or you're trying to build something, it'd be very difficult to get a loan, especially one that's not a very high percent. Um, there's small loans up to 5,000. Um, the initial pot was 20,000, so that's um, uh, you know, p p potentially for newcomers. Um, it's payable over three years, and all the money that, all the interest that pays back just goes right back into the loan. Nobody's making any money off of it. And so who paid into it? Um, so I'm located, I work out of the local settlement agency, which is the North Bay District Multicultural Center. We're located right downtown. Um, so they um, contributed 5000 Our local employment services, Yes Employment, contributed 5000 The Labor Market Group, which is our local workforce um, planning board, and then also the City of North Bay. And so that gave us 20000 Then LIP really offered the kind of the structure for uh, doing the research and the development around the program itself. So again, I've already covered some of these details, um, a big one being there's no Canadian credit, credit history required and character-based. Um, ha we have it integrated into the North Bay Immigration Portal because we were able to use some of the MEO funds, which MEO is a provincial um, funding pot that funds immigration portals, so online things. So that's where we have it living there. It's the application's entirely online, um, and we have an online eligibility quiz, which we really wanted to focus on because we didn't want folks to invest time, energy, their hopes and dreams into this application and maybe they're not even eligible. So we spent a, you know, a good chunk of time developing this eligibility quiz and, and on the right side of the screen you'll see there's just a snippet um, there. And so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't indicate that they will get a loan, but it gets them thinking about, oh, okay, so maybe I need to do this beforehand. It gives them an idea of what they'll be required to do. Um, and, the, you know, a really cool part is that the loan can be used for more than tuition or, or assessments or exam fees. We're in northern Ontario. Maybe you need snow tires to get to where you're going. Child care, groceries. Really, I mean, the, the loan committee is, is pretty open to, you know, doing what we can to, to get you where you need to be so that you can be successful. And so after the project was established and it was running, um, it, 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 it is now administered through the settlement agency. So not bankers, um, settlement workers work with um, the loan applicants um, to make sure that they're, you know, staying up in their payments and that's who the um, loanee would connect with if they were falling behind on payments or something like that. And then of course a really important part is our, the uh, literacy component because money is different everywhere and even if you b grow up in Canada, um, financial literacy is not something that we all have the opportunity to do well at. So we had a financial literacy guide created um, using some, actually we work closely with a partner, um, a local branch of the Royal Bank, uh, to develop a, a North Bay specific um, financial literacy guide. So it's about 26 pages and it's right there on the same page where folks would apply for the uh, loan. And then we also have a video, a five minute video um, that's very overarching, this is the difference between a credit union and a bank, and this is what savings means, and this is what credit history means. Um, so um, I would highly encourage you to even just look at the video. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's well done, and, and uh, I think it, you know, anybody can access the guide and the video. You don't have to go through the program itself. Um, this screen here is the application process, um, probably nothing surprising here. The main key is the LRC or the Loan Review Committee is who conducts the interview. So every organization that paid into it, they have a seat on that representation. We also have a banker person, a money person on that, on that committee as well. And then we have a transparent and clear process in terms of questions and scoring and that kind of thing um, to make sure that everything's fair. What I wanted to say about this is that you know, I, as a LIP, and we're one of the older LIPs, we've been around since 2007, 2008, and so 
it, it can be challenging and engage, engaging folks to get on board with not just supporting newcomers but really investing and and investing money but but i i was surprised how quick folks were on board for donating not donating but contributing funds because this is you know very rarely do you get to have a warm and fuzzy you know what you're a good person you are working hard you have a plan and you want to work here and contribute to our you know economy yes we can help you do that it is a it is an all around feel good experience um, and so with that though then then these community partners become invested not just in that one newcomer but newcomers as a group and and it, it starts to demystify who these newcomers are um, it also, you know, highlights the fact that these are very talented, skilled people. Uh, the, some of the folks I've gone through are, are you know, they're doctors, they're lawyers, um, one, one was a truck driver. And then these newcomers, of course, are paying, uh, everything they pay back goes back into the fund, meaning that all their interest that they paid is going to help another newcomer get to where they're wanting to go. Um, and, and just the last point there, when a community invests directly in, into newcomers as individual people, investment becomes a tool to foster a sense of belonging. And that's really the piece of retention, at least, you know, that I believe, is that you can give folks jobs or, or people can have great jobs. They can have a beautiful home and have all the lakes that we have here around North Bay, but people need to feel a sense of belonging. And so when people are investing in them, then they'll invest back into the community. So I'll stop there because I think I'm just at my time. Um, that's my contact info, and I look forward to any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Meg. I think that's a, a great message you've left us with about um, what this kind of investment means, not just in financial terms and, and uh, opportunity, but uh, for these individuals, but also that fostering of a sense of belonging um, mm -hmm. that uh, really uh, helps create a sort of a sense of self-sufficiency and a and common purpose. I think it connects us to our neighbors, and, and it's wonderful. So I really appreciate that. Thank you very much, Christina, Kathy, and Meg um, for sharing your expertise and insights with us. Um, we've now concluded the formal portion of um, today's um, uh, webinar, and it's time for our, um, well, it's not quite time for our audience Q&A. Before we go to our audience Q&A, I'm going to uh, uh, get started with a couple of questions of my own, and then we'll be moving. So please, everybody, do use that Q&A box to submit your questions. But let me get begin, let me begin with, with a couple of questions for our speakers. Um, our research here at the Immigrant Futures Project suggests um, that immigrant attraction retention can not only help reverse population decline and revitalize um, communities, it, it may also help stem the out-migration of young people, um, which is, uh, uh, you know, a tragic and, and challenging uh, reality for so many uh, smaller and regional communities. So let's talk for a minute. How, how does your work impact opportunities for young people in your communities? And, and maybe we can um, start with, uh, with you, Meg. Thanks, Kim. Um I think you know that's a it could be a complex question but I think you know one of the things is 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 when folks are moving out especially youth uh, to bigger centers say like Toronto um, or Ottawa is that there's something there that we don't have here and 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 it's it's jobs of course but also you know culture um, recreational activities just a, a, a different feeling of what's available and so as as we bring more and more newcomers to our communities invite them in um, ensure that they're integrating successfully and having a sense of belonging then then similar kind of things will start happening in our communities because th that's why they're happening in bigger centers you know food is such an important piece that's probably one of the things I hear often about newcomers coming to North Bay is not being able to find certain spices and things like that. And so having opportunities like that to bring stuff in to North Bay, and that could be from Toronto, that could be from wherever, I think, you know, it, it starts to, well, literally create a more diverse community. And so especially when, when you're talking about folks who might be queer or trans or people that have a disability, you know, they might go to a bigger center because it's, it feels and is more accessible. And so the more that we can diversify who's here but also do it in a thoughtful, meaningful, and safe way, then there's more space for anybody to be here. Oh, that's great. How about, um, and, and, and Kathy, would you like to comment on, on, on the impact of your work uh, in terms of young people? Sure. I think what, some of what we've found is that when we really reach out looking for mentors or community connectors or people to volunteer in the agency, 
quite often it's youth, it's younger folks who are really looking to connect with newcomers, learn about other places, potentially learn another language. But a lot of the resources as well that we've developed over time are uh, available to everyone in the community. So our job aggregator is used by everyone. When we look at the, um, the youth and we look at the stats for our, our web stats on it, it's locally or regionally or within Canada. So we're hoping that that's bringing everyone to um, what's available in the community and connecting them. But I think in what we've seen in our um, public forums and our immigration forum and uh, the outreach that we've been doing, young people are really interested in the diversity of our community. They're um, interested in the growth of our community and the sustainability and the potential that's there to keep their family here and uh, stay close to home if they can. So I think that they're invested in what we're doing as well. I think that that's right. And, and, and finally, let's go to, to Meg. Would you like to comment on the impact um, of strategies like these on, on youth retention? I think you mean Christina. I mean, I could talk more. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> um, Christina, okay. yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I just wanted to add to what Meg and Kathy said. So in, in the Northern Attraction sh series, there really is a drill down on the data that really helps educate people on what is possible in Northern Ontario. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned in my, um, in my research, I really think that small communities don't do that great of a job at marketing their strengths. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, things like shelter costs or home costs are much lower in smaller communities, particularly in Northern Ontario, especially when you compare it to places like York Region or Toronto. Um, only Ottawa really comes close to the northern home prices. Uh, the percentage of individuals with a non-university education in the 150,000 after-tax income group from northwest and northeastern Ontario is much bigger than in Toronto, um, Ottawa, York, or Peel. And, you know, owning a house is much more realistic. So I think as smaller communities start to market these great features and strengths to newcomers, perhaps the people in those communities it would also speak to them. And, you know, in addition to the things that, that Meg had mentioned as to why people might be leaving smaller communities for things like opportunity um, or more diversity, you know, for job opportunities, there are a lot of jobs available in Northern Ontario. It's just making sure that the, they're marketed to the right group and that those skill sets match what's available. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And, and another thing that came out of Immigrant uh, Futures research on the question of retention, cause, um, which is a really hard part, is uh, uh, you know a clear uh, finding is that uh, experiences of discrimination or exclusion are often primary reasons why people don't stay in the, in their communities. So um, let's ta just talk very briefly about what kind of strategies are being inc uh, or your communities are incorporating uh, into their um, immigration strategies to reduce racism and other forms of discrimination. Um, and uh, again, let's go to you, Meg, on that one. Um, so yes, that that is definitely, I, I would say, the biggest piece um, that, that impacts a feeling of belonging. Um, now, whether the newcomers are able or do point it at that, um, I, I see it as growing up in North Bay, um, the racist and discriminatory um, you know, attitudes, but also systems. And so, so the way that you know, I can see lip work and, and, and a reason for the loan program is to acknowledge these systemic barriers, which are often based on you know, colonialist, patriarchal, even misogynist um, 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 practices is, you know what, okay, so there's this barrier where newcomers can't get a loan in order to get back to work in their field because Canadian um, uh, um, credit is required. What can we do to, to fill that gap, that, that, that barrier that's there, you know, a person-created barrier? Um, so how can we help folks navigate the system to try to level the playing field? And so, you know, it's also having conversations like this, but it's, it's, it's finding these systems that, that exist and trying to break them down. And then also when you're breaking them down, point it out to other people. Like, did you know this is a thing? Because a lot of people didn't, don't, don't know that, you don't, mm -hmm. um, that, that international credit does not transfer. Yeah. So just building greater awareness, that's a great strategy. And how about, how about you, um, Kathy, in terms of incorporating sort of uh, anti-racism and anti-discrimination strategies, how important is that to your I strategy? Think, 
I think it's critical. And when we first began any of the work that we did, um, my suggestion to everyone was never assume that who you have at the table, who you have participating, who you have at a meeting representing X, Y, or Z agency has had any anti-racism or anti-oppression training at all. You don't know who they have sent as their rep. So we started with the lowest common denominator assumption that we are going to do anti-racism and anti-oppression training. We're going to be talking about um, what the issues are facing newcomers in our community. We're going to talk about what the issues are facing Indigenous people in our community. We did uh, both um, anti-racism and anti-oppression and Indigenous cultural awareness training with the entire group. It didn't, mm -hmm. matter, it didn't matter to us if you had taught this all your life. We were all participating. And that was a wonderful starting off point. And then from there, we really focused on real stories of real people and success stories and champions in the community, telling stories, making those available, having um, a success story online to really let people put faces to a story and a success that uh, they start to understand who's growing our community and how this is happening and um, what happened with them in their journey and who welcomed them and how did their neighbors help them and what happened at the school and all of those things and what can they do. And using that was a wonderful key for us. <laughs> That's great. That's excellent. So I've uh, I've got lots of questions coming in. So we're going to move quickly now to um, some of the questions from our audience. I have one from Regis on on uh, the theme of collaboration and partnership, which came up quite a bit today. Regis says I'm having a difficult time convincing all the organizations need to work in partnership in our province. It seems they're reluctant to share information. Uh, it seems it, it's working for you. Do you have any ideas about how to convince organizations? to work together. So uh, any tips on, on collaboration? Uh, let's go let's go to let's go to Christina maybe this time. Okay, thank you. So I'm just reading the question. Having to just tips on how to get people to come together. What what brought the Northern Policy Institute, for example, to this uh, this immigration challenge? Um, I, I think what's really important about getting you know people at the table is starting to have that open communication at the very beginning. Um, you know, when, when you're in the planning phases or at any point when you can think of some, somebody that should be involved in a strategy, it's really important to open that door at the very beginning at the front. So it's not like an afterthought. It's something that was well thought out in the beginning. And, um, you know, in order to have a culture of information sharing and where, you know, people are sharing data and research, I think what really helps is maybe starting that piece yourself and maybe opening those doors with sharing the information or data or research that you've collected yourself and kind of um, setting that tone. So I, th I think it's just really important to reach out to people and having really clear communication about what the strategy is, what the goals are, what the expected outcomes are, who's at the table, who you're inviting, and having that constant communication throughout. Okay, very good. And Meg, do you want to, do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, totally agree with what Christina is saying in terms of you being the first to share. Um, there's lots of reasons why folks don't want to share. Often it's because if I share, then maybe someone else will do this work and we won't be funded and all my employees will lose their jobs. So there's real reasons why, you know, or it feels like real reasons why people don't want to share. And so if you're leading the way and you share and you're saying why you're sharing because you, it's, 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 it's about the work or it's about the community or it's about the newcomer, that's, that's super important. Um, and I think also then sharing what you need. And then maybe people will feel, oh, I can maybe help with that. Some, um, um, one way I've done that I did a few years ago was kind of like a speed dating thing where, where different people from different organizations were at, you know, we had a bunch of small tables and I think we gave people five minutes each and you would say one thing that your organization does really well, one thing you want to share and one thing you want help on. And then each person said that. Um, and it could be something really small or it could be something really big. Um, it, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, but I think also, you know, thinking about why are people scared of sharing and if, and if you're able to say from the get-go, this isn't why we're wanting to share. It's not because we're wanting to take your funding or, or reinvent what you're already doing. <laughs> but it's tricky. It is tricky. It is. And Kathy, do you have any, any tips for bringing new stakeholders together, bringing, uh, engaging a wider spectrum of stakeholders across the community? It's a, it's a really difficult thing to convince um, folks who really feel like there's 
they're scared to come to the table because of something that may happen or, or um, opening themselves up. But I found that when I invited people to group sessions and discussions that we had in the Immigration Partnership and other meetings, there were some that attended and some that didn't. And I really kept track of who was coming and who wasn't. And then the others that may not want to come to that type of uh, discussion, I met with them one-on-one -on -one and spent an awful lot of money in coffee, but still, um, <laughs> you know, met with them, discussed things, um, gave them the freedom to ask me the questions that they might not want to ask in an open forum and said, you know, what are your concerns? How can I help you? What, what are you um, concerned about? Or, you know, why are you reluctant to come to the table? What is it? You know, I can tell you more about it that you don't have to ask in the open session, if, and that's fine. Now, smaller centers like ours, you kind of know everyone. Right? We know the players in the game. We know who um, is participating. We know executive directors of other agencies. We know uh, people that have lived here for years or who's doing what. So we're able to um, connect with them and have those discussions. And if not, then it's through someone else who may know them and offer that reassurance. But it is a long haul. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying it's a magic wand type of situation because it is. It really is developing relationships over long periods. But I found that different people really needed a different approach. Okay, great. And I've got a, we're running out of time. We're going to go a few minutes over to get a few more of these questions. I've got a question here from Devin Franklin, who's with the World Education Service in Toronto. Um, and for you, Kathy, she, she says you mentioned being uh, more intentional about immigrant attraction rather than casting a wide net. And she wants to know what sort of resources or pre-arrival um, agencies do you leverage to reach a more targeted group of immigrants? Um, that would be a good fit based on available jobs in your community? So at this point, um, we haven't really worked with many pre-arrival agencies. We've been working with our Community Economic Development uh, Commission here in the city and for Northwestern Ontario, mainly because we've got more than 100 times the applications and interest that we need at the moment. But um, over time, you know, our referrals go out. There was another question that came up too about windmill, and uh, we did, we refer. We refer out of Thunder Bay to all of the agencies that people may need to get what they need to be able to work here. We've also um, worked with our partners in settlement and arrivals and pre-arrival, certainly ISANs and others across the country, with who's already in the country or who they know is arriving and who they have contact with based on the um, positions that we have. So the Rural Employment Initiative out of um, the Newcomer Centre of Peel, looking to who do they have, who is in the country, who is connected with their employment um, programming that could find work in Thunder Bay and referring those back and forth, certainly. But broader than that, with pre-arrival agencies, not an awful lot of um, focus there yet. Okay. I'm going to go right away to a question for Grant Duckworth. Um, Grant asks, <clears throat> what are your thoughts about the proposed municipal nominee program? What capabilities will, will large and medium-sized cities need to qualify if it does become a reality? So um, let's just broaden that question a little bit to um, to speak more to the to, to the role of cities um, and municipality, local governments in um, how important is that in regional and rural contexts? The uh, um, the leadership of, a, of the municipal, the, act, the city actor themselves in, in moving programs like the municipal nominee program forward. Um, do you, uh, you want to take a stab at that, Christina? Uh, I mean, municipalities, it's really tough because they have a really large job in the settlement of newcomers and, you know, kind of countering any sort of population declines or, or what have you and, and welcoming those newcomers. Um, but I, in terms of the municipal nominee program, I'm not sure if that's so much of the provincial nominee program. It, it's, in, it's, I guess, this proposed municipal nominee program. I don't know. Do Kathy or, or Meg, do you have any any uh, comments on that? Yeah, uh, Meg here, I do. So um, from from my understanding is that um, the RNIP, the Rural Immigration Pi Northern Immigration Pilot, um, is, is maybe a precursor to to the municipal, because that's really what's happening. It might not be city-specific. It's not 
municipality specific, the RNIP. Um, a lot of the RNIPs are, are kind of like a, like a, a cluster of smaller communities. And, and so what, what IRCC has told us in the process of, you know, revving up for RNIP is, is you know, what happened in the Atlantic provinces was it was an employer-led kind of, um, uh, well, program. The RNIP is community-led, and so the community is setting who, like, you know, what kind of skills are we needing, what kind of jobs do we need to fill, what kind of people, I, I don't really like saying that, but do we want coming to our community? And so I think, you know, the RNIP is going to offer a lot of, um, uh, you know, background information on how the, like, a, a municipal one would, would run. Um, it is a lot of work, though. I mean, I, Kathy's already in it. Our RNIP doesn't start till January. Kathy started <laughs> a couple weeks ago. Um, but I think it could play be, because the, the northern context is so different, and even just two hours apart down the road is so different. Hmm. Well, then just before I turn that over to you, Kathy, I'll, I'll add a question from Mark V, who wants specifically to know um, who defines the Thunder Bay attraction and retention strategy, like who owns it and leads it. So is that a, how... Yes, That's I can, a good I can question. speak to both of those. Yes, speak yeah. to both of those questions together. Um, the rural and northern municipal, uh, the rural and northern immigration pilot was focused on municipalities. So, with the Thunder Bay. Um, our NIP attraction and retention that sits solely within the Community Economic Development Commission. We're the settlement partner on that. We are assisting with, um, you know, the connecting to jobs, the support for spouses, anything else that may come out of it. But that's that group that the CEDC has put together. But as far as attraction and retention for the entire community, that's really been a community-wide and Northwestern Ontario-wide group discussion. So it's been around uh, municipalities, certainly um, local immigration partnerships, both the Northwestern Ontario and the Thunder Bay LIP have had that discussion, and then um, uh, smaller groups uh, like the RNIP have had that discussion. So it was the former immigration portal group that was having uh, mm -hmm. really the responsibility of doing a lot of this work in partnership with the city, with NOMA, the Northern Ontario Municipal Association, and others. But now it seems to have come to rest um, in the offices of the Community Economic Development Commission, which is fine. And we are all involved, but they're, they're leading it right now through this pilot project, rather than having too many things going on at once. Um, and back to Grant's question around um, large and medium-sized cities qualifying, this pilot piece really was um, hard to define right from the beginning. It was um, looking at smaller and rural and northern communities and how those were being defined was even uh, part of that discussion. And so the size of the community was, was quite small. Whether or not that translates into a, real, a municipal nominee program, a broader municipal nominee program in Canada, I'm not sure. But I think that many municipalities over the years have been um, trying to trying to move towards that rather than a provincial nominee. Certainly us here in the north of Ontario have been talking about it because the um, provincial nominees all end up in southern Ontario, and we were really not seeing many of them in the north. And so that's where this piece was really welcomed. I know that between the Atlantic Immigration Pilot and this uh, rural and northern municipalities uh, involvement, there's going to come a lot of suggestions around how this happens and how it works for particularly different sizes of municipalities, larger cities, um, regions across Canada. And I think that I'm really welcoming that conversation because yeah. I think it needs to be looked at differently than just provincially. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> A local context, that's very good. Thank you very much. I have now two um, quick questions for you, Meg, about the loan program. Um, Mary Ip wants to know about some of the challenges that you experienced setting up the fund. And there is another question from Elizabeth about um, some of the initial startup costs. So I thought I just we'd bundle those questions. Yeah. Just quickly give us a little, uh, just a, a short answer on on some of those um, getting started, uh, early sure. growing pains. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say the um, the the biggest challenge um, actually wasn't getting the money. I thought that would be the biggest challenge. Um, the biggest challenge was was doing it responsibly, um, and so what that meant was. Um, 
you know, all, including a financial literacy guide, which meant that, okay, we need to hire somebody that's dedicated, that has skills, that, that can do this. And so um, how we did it was, so with MEO funding, MEO did not fund the, the actual cash in the loan fund. They funded um, setting up the platform. They funded um, the research around it, creating the financial literacy guide, you know, hiring a company to do the video, and then also paying uh, the 10% of a intern um, because we hired a NOHFC intern, um, which we just have to cover 10% of the salary. And so that person um, worked on, worked, I worked closely with them and to really guide this whole thing. And so um, you need a person, you definitely need a person to be living and breathing this because there's a lot of content out there. There's a lot of things that you don't need to reinvent. Um, but, you know, we used a few different pots of money and then, of course, the cash came from a few different partners. Hmm. That's great. Okay, thank you very much. So our last question today is from uh, Michael Kerr. And, um, oh, just a second, sorry. Uh, Michael Michael is asks a really important question. He says, um, uh, riffing off sort of the earlier uh, discussion of anti-discrimination, anti-racism work, he wants to know about work being undertaken to build bridges between Indigenous people and people of color in your region. So, um, you know, understanding the diversity uh, of uh, within the, the immigrant, not just within immigrant populations or that immigrants bring, but that larger uh, conversation about the diversity that all that we exist in every community and mm -hmm. and how to address it. Um, mm -hmm. and, but I think specifically around bridging uh, some of that work into the indigenous um, communities. So uh, maybe Christina, would you like to com to to offer a comment on that? Um, well, an example of, of some of this work on the ground is the work that NPI did for the City of Greater Sudbury on how to strengthen newcomer economic integration. And, I mean, it wasn't just for newcomers, but there was also work around the discrimination noted as a barrier and what strategic plan document, what strategic plans, like what they could do to provide strategies to tackle those barriers. But I think I'll let Meg and Kathy speak more on this because their work is more on the ground, and I think that they probably have a lot more to say. All right. Well, thank you. How about then going to you, Kathy, on that one? All right. Michael, the conversation that we had just last week with um, mm. Avi Go and others was exactly around these issues. Um, and it's something that I've been working on and working with for many years now. It's close to my heart. It's certainly working with youth in Thunder Bay, um, we fought long and hard to find funding for youth programming that wasn't indigenous specific or newcomer specific. Mm -hmm. When we would say, we're going to do this with all of the youth of Thunder Bay, bringing together especially indigenous youth that have come to the city from outside that are living here going to school and newcomer youth who have arrived. And our funders would look at us um, and wonder, well, what are you talking about? We'll fund this, but not this, and we'll fund that, but mm -hmm. not that. So mm -hmm. we finally found, um, through combination of things, funding to provide youth uh, programming around mentorship and integration and recreation and you name it, education, homework clubs, multicultural clubs, and you name it, for all youth together. And I can tell you that the connections between newcomer youth, especially refugee newcomer youth and indigenous youth moving to the city are incredible. And mm -hmm. those relationships um, happen organically and they've continued throughout many years. And they come back and volunteer because they're so interested in um, those relationships between the groups and it's fabulous. And if we can only have that grow into the adult population and really, yeah. um, you know, take that home, it's been wonderfully successful. And I think it's an absolute critical need of, of having everyone who um, lives here and goes to school here and works here and uh, participates together in communities working together. And uh, that bridge building is part of the focus that we have and we are just down the street not too far from our uh, friendship center and we work closely on those issues that's wonderful we need and we need that kind of inspiration that the young offer us and meg meg do you want to do you want to comment before we close um i would say i mean there's i i think that um we can always do better especially in the immigration sector with with learning from and working with indigenous folks um so you know 
<clears throat> and 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 it not just being around events or or or, or projects, but but every day. So things like having folks from from the friendship center sit on my lip council and also myself sitting on their on the community action circle to make sure that it's not just around you know specific things but that we're often engaging and um, you know newcomers want to know about the history of this land and often the history they get is not the correct history and so what what I've tried to do is create opportunities for indigenous folks and newcomers to come together and do kind of like a storytelling um, and and you know create relationships um, and give opportunities to build those relationships but I think we can always do better, and we should always do better. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all. We're at the end of the Q&A, um, and before I go, I, I would just like to close quickly by asking all three of you uh, one, uh, what, what I call my short fire question, just a word. Leave us with a, a word of inspiration. Um, if you had to leave us with one important message to share with people about this, the sort of immigrant imperative we've been discussing today, what would that be? Um, maybe we'll go first to you, Meg. Oh, me first. Oh, gosh. Okay, so a <laughs> word of inspiration. Yeah. Um, keep at it. I don't know <laughs> what I'd have to say because sometimes it's really hard to know what to do other than just keep at it. That's great. And Kathy? My comment would be use your successes and make sure that people hear about the the good work that's happening and the successful stories and the even the challenges, but make sure that people are understanding and hearing about it. The more they know, the better decisions and choices they can make and the reactions will be very different. Kathy, that was way too good. <laughs> <laughs> and Christina, uh, what, is there a message you want to leave us about the immigrant imperative that we've been talking about today? Um, I guess the, the short phrase I'd say is just don't underestimate the resources around you and the people that are, you know, close, closer than you think that could, could help your strategy. I think that's that's a wonderful um, place to end today's very rich uh, conversation. Thank you. Our time has run out. Thank you for joining us today to to explore this rich set of ideas on Canada's immigrant future. Today's um, session is part of a new webinar series that we're, we're conducting on building a welcoming economy for Canada's smaller cities, towns, and regions. So on behalf of Cities of Migration and all our participants, let me thank guest speakers Christina Zeffi, Kathy Woodbeck, and Meg Raymore for a brilliant exchange of ideas. And a special thanks, too, to Evelyn Sue, our Learning Exchange Coordinator and Producer par excellence here at Cities of Migration. And to our audience, and cities of migration everywhere. Imagine this excellent work being interpreted in your city, adapted by your organization, or changing your neighborhood. We'd like to hear your stories and share more good practices, so please stay connected.